All right, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> um, we've got about 21 folks. I'm guessing that's probably in the neighborhood of what we're gonna get um, today. So why don't we start uh, start off. Um, Jacob, uh, Jacob, Ethan, you guys wanna, why don't we start off with the straw man revisions and then we can go into the other items uh, that um, the joint utilities and uh, Dr. Bartlett um, commented on. Sure, we can do that. Great, thank you, sir. Let me um, pull up the document. I want to make sure I'm looking at the one that we sent out. Just to, sure. Um, Unless you have a new and improved version since then. I don't think there's necessarily a new and improved one. I just want to make sure I'm not. I know I'm, I'm, I'm teasing you. Yeah. Um, like last time. And I am uh, recording this just for everyone's benefit. Just so you know, anyway. Um, actually, Ethan, do you have, I'm trying to pull it, I'm not finding it real quick. Um, all right. Um, I just sent you what um, Taylor sent out um, on October third uh, at almost seven six fifty two. I, I have it. Um, I just don't know. All I know is that this is the the <clears throat> the latest and greatest version to, to replace the mistaken one I sent out. So I'm not sure what changes have been made. This is just um, this was the the final one. So I, I, this is the one that incorporated all of the uh, steps today, and it's not redlined, so I can't really point to what exactly is different. Apologies for not being prepared to speak to that. Yeah, I don't see the the red lines, but I think I think Ethan, to your point, what was included in this one was um, the incorporation of the the. the technical conference as well as then within step one um, incorporation of conversation with the the gas utilities uh, as a data collection point I think your honor I think what we really need to speak to is um, you know, just some confusion that seems to be uh, lingering regarding the iterative process that we're proposing. Sure. There seems to be continued uh, stakeholder concerns that we are that with the cutoff point where we say we are going to execute, and you know, we tr we've built a process with multiple points of stakeholder input into a plan that is the plan of that year but we refresh those plans annually a little at least we we're annual but different utilities you know we refresh them regularly and so you know this is a mobius strip kind of a proposal yes your last comments on the plan we execute we choose to execute will not be in that plan however they will be folded into the next cycle going back to stage one. And so there is no loss of stakeholder input. And in fact, should our plan prove faulty, uh, stakeholders will have their, you know, their proof of we said you should have done this and that, that, will, be, uh, that will be on the record. So um, I, I feel like that, you know, if we can get past that, we would be moving towards a, a, a process that we could actually begin implementing, which is, you know, getting this into regs has been one of the, the goals of this group at, at some point. And, you know, if we could get agreement from um, 
I think Dr. Bartlett is the only one who's still concerned about this. If he could agree that this is an iterative process and if perhaps if he needs language to, to um, propose that, if he could pr write us something he would like written in to make it that very clear so he has comfort with the process, that would be very helpful. <laughs> Now, um, he, he did, sir, and I'm, I'm assuming, Ethan, you're referring to Dr. Bartlett's comments from yesterday? Um, yes, among okay. them, right. he's made them before, but yeah, okay. I just, yeah. Yeah. I, I okay. wanted to make, <clears throat> I, I did think that that was an issue that we had put to bed, so. Um, okay, no problem. Let's uh, see if we can get this squared away. Uh, Dr. Bartlett. Whoops, yeah, there morning. we are, okay. Yeah, good morning. Um, Yes. Um, so, yeah, we appreciated the the addition of the technical conference into which uh, into the the straw man, which when the the last ver written version we had uh, didn't include it, but when Ethan described what they thought was the latest, it was included. So, so it's in, and that's appropriate. It's obviously mandated under nine one two five six. But the confusion becomes the technical conference it seemed to me is the major forum for discussion and might actually include more stakeholders than the uh, the other steps in the process. Uh, but in any case, uh, it's certainly a place where it seems that changes might still be made because there's the possibility of a commission order at that point, as well as um, there's an opportunity specified for um stakeholder uh comments and so it but starting at that step step five and in step six um we start talking about the next cycle now maybe ethan's implying that the cycle is annual i thought that the cycle was going to be the maybe three year period so i'm not sure that we're clear on that but in any case it seemed to me that at the technical conference step there was still room for input into the present draft plan not going not having to wait until the next cycle for those comments to be taken into consideration but that, and it's not clear and, and actually when it gets to step six it's, it refers back to step four but step four is talking about the present cycle and step six is saying well we're going to look at that feedback um now for a future cycle, so it's it's just a bit confusing. And uh, but the important point to me is that it seems the technical conference is still a point for input to the development of the plan before it is finalized. Well, the step five is uh, incorporating feedback received so far, and and then how that feedback is captured. So the feedback is from four and you, you know, we, I guess, you know, if, if addition, we, we already have, I mean, we could put in the, you know, feedback from. Uh, we can, I think even we could probably tweak the language slightly to make it clear. Cause I, I think what we're trying to get at is it, it is a very much an iterative process, right? The things are constantly evolving. Obviously, we we continue to reforecast, um, and so as we get direction from the commission, you know, should they provide specific direction in an order? Should we get specific feedback either through step four or during the technical conference? I, I think what we're trying to say is, in step six, we will kind of um, take that feedback, respond to it, and and outline kind of what we are looking to incorporate or not looking to incorporate. And that'll certainly be incorporated into the plan. I think where then stakeholders will most see that information and that incorporation into the plan is when they start to view that next cycle's plan that gets published as we go through that process. Um, and especially because you know much of this is focused on the medium and long term as we're trying to get feedback on projects before they go into initiation. Uh, that feedback can be incorporated into the plan and then that'll be reflected the next time we're kind of going through the cycle and publishing it so i think that's what we're trying to get at not to say al that like we hear your feedback and we're not taking it into account until like a year later it's certainly getting accounted for it's just the way it's going to be reflected is as we build out that next that next iteration of the the plan that's where you're really going to start to see it 
So, <clears throat> Jacob, in other words, so the technical conference, you anticipate presenting the plan to the commission. And then as, as I read it now, it, you're going to receive feedback for consideration in the next cycle. So you don't view the technical conference as um, like, like an opportunity that Al had indicated where the, the plan could change based on either, you know, the commission input, commission order, or, um, you know, stakeholder uh, comments. Is that? I guess. It, it might just be the way it's written. I just want to, I right. think that's the issue. I, I, I think, and this, we don't view, I, I don't think we view necessarily a distribution system plan as a concrete, you know, book of 100 pages that we we rubber sure. stamp and then go execute, right? This Understood. is a, a constantly evolving thing. Yep. And so um, when we think about incorporating that commission's order, should they provide an order or stakeholders provide feedback that we then take into account, that it, it's not like we're opening that book up ripping out a page putting in a new page closing that one and sending it off to go be to go be like completed it it's constantly evolving and so we will account for that and build that into our plan and and just saying you the externally you'll see that reflected in that next cycle as we go through the conversation and publish it okay i i, I get it so um just just it this the discussion raises a couple of questions uh, and things one a couple of things that i think need definition um one is what is the technical conference i mean if it's not a point if if the commission is going to get to see the plan for the first time and it, as it's quote final um and there is the opportunity for the commission to weigh in and there's also an opportunity as it says in step five for comments by parties um what's the what is the technical conference? I, I don't think we've actually specified that. If it is it the final review and feedback into the development of the current plan, or is it just a presentation and some comments that will be taken into consideration potentially in the future? Uh, we're not clear about that. I'm also not clear what we when we're talking about cycle. Are we talking about a one year cycle? Are we talking about a three year cycle? Are you planning to have a technical conference every year? No, probably not. So um I think we just need to be get to clarify these things because as he says, you know, as Ethan said, we're we're gonna try to put it into regs and it has to be clear. Um well to to your last point, I, I think that's a very good question. Obviously, I think the the order outlines an annual technical conference, but um I, I think something that's worth discussing as we had talked about during the previous phase is having some level of fit flexibility in terms of the timing of all this that best fits each utility. So if there is an annual technical conference. How do we then marry with what each of our utilities are presenting versus when are they kind of like building out these plans? So um, I don't necessarily have a, a proposal at the moment, but I do think to your point, Al, uh, we do kind of have to marry those two things, what we saw from the order around an annual technical conference and how we've kind of been viewing um, some of that flexibility in terms of um, when those plans are kind of being run and published. Mr. Kathan, you want to jump in, sir? Yeah, I just wanted to ask a basic question, which is, so uh, I understand the process as it's being uh, described, but so the technical conference and, uh, and the way that the commission did actually note that there will be ability for comments and, you know, uh, pr perhaps, you know, inquiry to the utility. Um, question is, what ha what's the purpose, you know, of that input from the stakeholders? Is especially if the commission is not, you know, making a, you know, a, a commitment to take any action. You know, they they say they might issue an order. So, are you saying all that input on the preview on the existing plan is going to be then reused for the next one? So it seems like we're out of sync. Um, I, I would like to point everyone to the language on page eleven of the order where the commission compares the technical conference to the process currently at use in case 9353, the annual performance reports on electric service reliability hearings. Um, comments are taken, but they do not change what's in the current plan. They, they, are, they, are, they are considered for the next cycle. So it is, um, that is how it works in 9353, the reliability performance uh, hearings, which 
have been a long established procedure in this with this commission. So the idea is yes, the final plan is presented, stakeholder final comment is presented, the commission can direct order, but there is a recognition that the uh, utilities are going to be moving forward and executing their plans, which the commission has been very clear that that risk is on that decision and risk is on us finally. And in the next year, we can then consider the feedback that we received on the plan that we are currently executing and adjust accordingly for the, the next cycle. Also, I'd like to point out that we did um, discuss that different utilities, and I don't want to speak for them, but different utilities do have different cycles that they are more comfortable with. Um, the commission does say annual here. We would continue to ask for the flexibility. Some utilities planning cycles, um, SMECO specifically, are, are more lengthy and um, because they don't have as much growth and as much um, as much staff to be applying to these kinds of problems whereas bg and e you know we have millions of customers uh, a lot our system is being constantly evolving you know, we would ask for flexibility there on the 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 um, periodicity of the reporting but or of the technical conferences but and planning but that's something down the line just want to point out that that was the part of the conversation we were having last phase may have gotten lost. Thanks. All right, thanks, Ethan. Dr. Bartlett, does that, or David, does that uh, address your concerns? Uh, I don't I don't think just by Al's reaction, I would say no, but. <laughs> it explains it, I'm not sure it addresses it. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I'm just looking at, um, again, I think if we can define what the cycle is for these technical conferences and, and their relationship to the plan, because on page six of the order, it says under this proposal, utilities would file five-year plans on a four-year cycle. So uh, what what are we talking about in terms of cycle? Are we talking about this is an annual process or, you know, Ethan just, you know, um, noted that the cycle is different for different groups, but we were I don't think talking about a one-year cycle for the technical conferences or for these plans. So I'm, I'm not sure. Again, I think we just have to be clear on this because if Al, it's- Can you if tell me talking about, you're reading the five-year plan for your cycle? I've got three documents open in front of me trying to follow this. Okay, I, I'm, I'm, when I was referring to page six, I was referring to the order and it's at the uh, end of the paragraph above other key non-consensus issues. That was the piece Riley, just, just to ch chime in. I think that that part of the um, order is talking about OPC straw man. So, oh, okay, yeah, right, okay. So, but so I guess what are we talking? But no one's specified what this cycle is in terms of this technical conference and so on. I just would like. I think it'd be helpful to know that if it's a if it's a three year cycle, it's different. If we're waiting three years for for comments to be taken into account, it's different from from waiting one year. Uh, I, I would like to reiterate that, the, again, we were looking at a cycle that would be different for different utilities. Uh, BG&E is interested in annual cycles. Um, I believe, and Jacob, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe that PHI wanted the ability to alternate years between PEPCO and DPL. And then um, I'm not sure where, F, where Potomac Edison landed at SMECO. Um, because of their their planning cycle is not as intense as the rest of us, and they have much fewer staff as well as lower um, growth altogether and, and changing that they do theirs on a three year cycle. But that would be for their particular group of stakeholders, which because they are a co op, are in fact the pe their their uh, ratepayers are the co op members. So yeah, and to add to that, I, I think I think within the utility straw proposal, we had put up to three years as like the, the cycle of like when utilities would look to file. Um, like I said, obviously the the commission had within the order put forward the annual technical conference. Um, and so I, I think we can talk through or think through whether, um, you know, wanting to, to try and align that with that, that kind of flexibility for the utilities or is there an ability to have kind of off years and on years of off years being updates within that if there's still a technical conference and then you know the utilities doing primarily you know as Ethan said some might do a three-year cycle with a you know just 
brief updates during those off years and, and kind of you know finding that right balance again trying to trying to land of of meeting that commission order but still kind of provide that flexibility for the utilities for um what is what is best okay so i guess based on this discussion if you if, if you all could just clarify the language on that you know just clarify what we what we're talking about here and and again it does seem to make the technical conference a place where it's presentational only because any comments or feedback aren't going to be incorporated into the plan as it's presented um it'll only happen later if it happens so it it again it doesn't strike me and again i i think that the technical conference may be a place where more stakeholders would participate than in the earlier stages um so i i just It says, okay, gather feedback. Yeah. TJ just put this into the notes, right? So gather feedback. Uh, so it just seems to me that the technical conference as, as envisioned is a place where additional input is provided into the finalization of the plan. And once again, I reiterate that the this is to follow the annual performance perfor report model where that is the final feedback. We have step four published a plan and received feedback once. I, once once per cycle for stakeholders to put in feedback for changing the current the plan that is to be executed seems like sufficient and then we are we move forward with our next plan and you get to see that next year and i also just want to make sure to clarify the last step in the the straw proposal process proposal is you know the consideration of the feedback and one of the pieces of that is is the utilities will publish kind of responses to the feedback that they've received right and so i think at that point it'll be feedback from step four as well as the technical conference and maybe we need to add that language in there that step six will also be responsive to any feedback in the technical conference but the idea is within step six you know while we may not you know publish republish you know that book and that plan what we are saying is this is the feedback we got this is how we did or didn't incorporate it. This is why we did or didn't incorporate it. So stakeholders would be able to see, yes, this is the information that that was taken into that plan. So you wouldn't have to wait until the next cycle to like actually see the, like what we responded to. You would see within that step six that, hey, the utilities did take this suggestion or make this change based off of the stakeholder feedback. So Jacob is, or is the, fix as easy as uh in step six just saying feedback received from stakeholders and the commission in state in steps four and five i mean I, we can add that in it, to have it, 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 it i'm just as, throwing that out there is that the it, it seems too easy so it probably <laughs> isn't so so harry has just no i mean I, so so uh yeah mr osborne um whom I don't, I, I, I don't know, um, has put in the language from the order, and uh, yeah, and then Harry Warren has noted that it says, okay, so it says the utilities propose that the commission hold a technical conference at which utilities will present their plans to the commission, gather feedback, and publish revised plans. So, is the publishing of revised plans suggests that that technical conference is a uh, an an additional informational point um, for and it's certainly for a commission order as well. Uh, so I, again, I just if we can just clarify this, I think um, is the language that I put in the chat sufficient? Um, in six. Is that state? Is that number six? Yes. May just want to add in response to commission and stakeholder feedback. Um, uh, yeah, Mr. Warren. Oh, hi. Yeah, this is Harry Warren, uh, Clean Grid Advisors. I know I'm sort of an occasional uh, uh, participant in this call. 
but I think just from what I'm hearing here, um, Ethan, in your in your wording, I think the issue is are the are the comments and the feedback being received during the technical conference something that the utilities at least will will hear and bake into a revised plan that they will then publish in that cycle i was i was sort of getting the feeling from what was said a few minutes ago that that is what's anticipated and that is what's written down but is your language ethan implying that what proposals will be evaluated or not evaluated are you still thinking that this is only for a future plan next at, at next year's technical conference or are you sort is your language meant to say you're going to give the rationale for what it is you are incorporating in this year's revised plan we specifically point to evaluating the feedback from stage four at that point and that the the response to um the technical conference that goes into the, the following year's plan okay so so when you read when you read the commission order that says that that at the technical conference you would present your plan gather feedback and publish revised plans you interpret published revised plans as we only meant that for a future plan not the current one that's being presented when you well you got to read the whole sentence it says the utilities propose that and the commission is an error there and the commission what is so an error there the, the language that i think was quoted was from the order but that was just recapping the utility proposal not necessarily uh where the commission was making decisions uh, the whole sentence that you are quoting begins with the utilities propose that the commission hold a technical conference at which the and the commission they are in error there that is not what the straw man has ever said that i see so, so, but you're saying further that pj you're saying that the order in another location specifies that it, in some way that such feedback will not be incorporated into the current plan they specifically and we you know we had what we had proposed was a in, in our, the language of our comments um a just a technical conference along the lines of the annual performance report that is what they specifically reference and that is a look forward looking comment yeah. I would only suggest that if we're going to, if, if this ultimately, and I, as far as I'm concerned, I think we are in the regulation that we kind of walking up to the regulation development phase, um, that there just needs to be, a, it's pretty obvious there needs to be a bit more clarity on this. Um, so if, if folks could clarify that, that would be helpful. I, and I think Al to that and Judge to your point earlier, I think within step six we can incorporate we'll also be responsive to the technical conference. So that way as the utilities kind of publish our responses to feedback, whether it's through comments filed as part of step four, or whether it's through what's communicated during the technical conference, I, I think we can incorporate that all of that within step six. So that way parties are seeing where we are or are not incorporating that feedback. Um, and like I said, I, I, I think a continued struggle I have is, is talking about this current plan versus next plan, because I think we, we see it as one plan that's just constantly evolving as we're, you know, doing additional evaluation and getting additional feedback and making changes to be able to effectively address the system and what the system needs. So we don't necessarily see this as this plan, next plan, two years from now plan. It, it is one plan that's constantly evolving. Um, and I think that's just kind of getting lost in some of this conversation. All right, um, got a couple <clears throat> folks with their hands up. Mark and then Jacob, uh, J.O. Hey, good morning, everybody. Mark from Potomac Edison. Uh, first, I, I was, was going to say what, what Ethan and Jacob did about, about the structure of the order um, and also kind of raise the same question about whether that's what the utilities were really trying to say. But 
just trying to think a little bit more practically about what's in a distribution plan. I mean, I, I could see to the extent that we're including individual projects, you know, we might include a project that we're going to, you know, let's say reconductor a line that we're going to do next year and we got to start next month, you know, you know, that, you know, you know, has to, has to start really quickly. We might also say, Hey, we're going to build a new substation five years from now and we're just going to start the planning process. So as we get that about the, the feedback, we might say, Hey, don't reconductor that line, put in a bunch of DER. We might say, Hey, we couldn't take that into account because the constraint is real today and we have to deal with it. Um, and then we also might say, hey, but we can take that into account for this future project because we have more time to plan and it's more reasonable to do that thing. And here's how we're going to do that. So I guess I'm kind of seconding what Jacob's saying about it's a living plan, um, you know, and that there's some areas in that feedback, we're going to say those things. Hey, it's just not practical to incorporate. Not that we didn't consider the feedback, but it's not practical to change our plans because we have to operate the system. But in these other areas, we are taking that that feedback. So. I mean, I, I do think that it is a, an opportunity to comment on what is the current plan and to to effectively possibly change it. It just may not affect things that are going to happen in the very near future. Um, you know, we do an annual an annual planning process. Um, that planning process does look this for Potomac Edison. You know, it does look at some at some you know immediate needs, five year needs, future needs, and stuff like that. But it is something that we do review um, every single year as part of our internal processes. Um, and we do see the annual uh, technical conferences a way to to show the stakeholders what our plan is um, and and provide that feedback. So I mean, I, I do think it meets the the requirements of what the commission laid out in the order. All right, thanks, Mark. Uh, Jacob, uh, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I. I just have a clarifying question. I, I thought I understood what we were talking about, but but maybe not. So uh, is what being is the, with the technical conference, is that different than the annual hearing on the DSP plans? The hearing was denied by the commission. Well, I mean, on page 11, it does say an annual hearing will include the review of annual DSP informational filing. So I, I guess my question was with whether that because I, th I thought on this call that there was some suggestion that maybe PHI would not do annual, they would do like biannual. Each individual PHI utility would do biannual. So in that case, I'm assuming that PHI is going to be proposing that th the annual hearing mentioned on page 11 is not an annual, actually an annual hearing. They would well, do it's, every it's like uh, the annual hearing is like 9353, the performance report hearing. Right. And so is the technical conference separate from that? Uh, that was my understanding. Okay, that's. But maybe we could suggest. I mean, for simplicity, one thing. I, uh, you know, no. I, I certainly would prefer less staff time. I don't know about you. Well, no, I just, I, I, that, I think that having a technical conference be separate from those annual hearings might yeah. be, might be helpful. So I, I think it might provide like a different because I, I, I mean. I have been involved in 9353 and it, you know, it, it's a very, um, you know, very routine process now with, with, with the commission. It's like a one day hearing, all the utilities, you know, present. I mean, in, in the case of 9353, of course, you have very objective metrics set out in Comar and the report is basically like, did you meet those objective metrics or not? I think that with DSP, there's going to be a lot more complexity, a lot more subjectivity in some of the, the decisions. So I'm not sure how well this 9353 model is, is going to work. But sure. to the extent that there's something that is sort of like 9353 and then supplemented by a technical conference, to me, I think that would actually add to the, I, it, I agree with you even that it adds to the work, but it might add to the value that the, you know, that, that the process gives. Jacob, are you, so just what you're saying or what I'm hearing you saying is maybe like 9353 is kind of looking back as to what occurred previously as yeah, to whether metrics were met. So where the technical conference would be looking forward as to what the uh, utility is planning on doing, are you envisioning an annual hearing to say, okay, this is, you know, how things went the previous year, something like that? I yeah that I mean I think we're all I I don't have like a specific idea I'm I my, I'm just trying to differentiate what, what, what people were talking what we about do between the two yeah and and I guess I have questions about that as well I mean it does appear that from the order it's talking about informational filings and then the reference to nine three five three suggests like a like a lower level of interaction between you know stakeholders and the utilities at that hearing so you know. A, a subsequent technical conference, I guess, depending on how the technical conference was set up, I, you know, 
uh, you know, could, could, could provide um, an ability for stakeholders to talk about a particular utilities plan in more detail. But and and that is what I assume is what be, is being proposed. If PH if Pep, if Pepco is going to go, you know, in one year and then wouldn't come back in for a technical conference until you know uh, the third year, then you know I'm assuming that, that each utility would have their own separate technical conference. Is that right? That's that's what I would think, uh, especially if they're on different cycles. Uh, Jacob posted something. Um, talking about uh, yeah, so I, I don't think, at least as I read the order, that they're two separate things. Okay, that, that's the language I was trying to put in there. Was they they say hearings, but they call it an annual technical conference hearing, and so I think when they refer to hearings later, they're just talking about that. So I don't think the order envision, at least as I read the language of the order, that it's necessarily envisioning two separate things. Um, and then to, to, to your question, Jacob, obviously around the timing for PHI and different things as we were talking about, I think that's what I was trying to get to earlier. Obviously, the commission envisions an annual process as they outline here. And so either you know, could consider aligning the uh, a hearing you know, on some of those different years with when those plans are, or I know something other states have considered is kind of like a on years, off years, where, where one is where you do the major filing and, and another is kind of just updates to it as part of that update. Um, and so that's something else that could be, you know, discussed and considered. But uh, I, I guess um, uh, along the lines of what I was talking about, as far as having an ability to um, interact with like one utility at a time to go into like the level of detail that I think you would want to, to do, would, would each utility have their own technical conference on a separate day or because in 9353, all the utilities, they, they, they file their reports and then there's like a one day hearing the utilities go up with like a slide deck present for maybe like 30 to 45 minutes answer questions and that's it you know is it is, is that what the utilities are are envisioning or are they envisioning that like potomac edison would come in on its own day and only potomac edison's technical conference would be held or pepco or pge I mean, I'll, I'll say I can't speak for everyone, but at least my initial thought on it was that it would all kind of be in one one annual technical conference that the utilities uh, would be able to um, review their their filings and, and be able to talk about the progress that's being made. I think obviously we'll also be doing those formal filings where, where parties will be able to also provide written comments and a ability to to review it so i don't think the technical conference is the only place where parties are going to be seeing this obviously this whole process is designed around being transparent throughout um so it's not like um the technical conference is is where we're kind of coming as an only point of conversation it's just a point of conversation um and so i, I at least as i was thinking about it it would be kind of one technical conference for all parties I think it, the or, doesn't the order talk about docketing separate ones? So, I, so this is Mark for PE. I, I want to agree with what, what Jacob said there, and, and that's a good point. Um, so I agree with Jacob Berlin, not that I'm disagreeing with Jacob Ausliner. Um, that, but yes, there are individual cases for each um, utility, but in the part of the order where it talks about the, the conference, it says that the conference is going to be in case. What's the case for this? Nine. Nine yeah, I get the case. 65. Yes, it says that it would be in this case, which to me is kind of an indication that Jacob Berlin is correct, that it's one conference for all the utilities. And and yeah, it might be a longer presentation than we do for, for service reliability. I agree that those presentations are often 10, 15 minutes, depending on how the last year went. These may be a little bit longer, but I think that's the idea is that you have each utility come up and then you have potentially other panel discussions where stakeholders can provide feedback there. But there are those individual case numbers as well where, where uh, different parties will be able to comment uh, separately on each plan. So Potomac Edison will have case, you know, 9,800 and you can provide comments in there. And then ultimately I kind of maybe those larger issues is what comes back to the technical conference. Mark, that, thanks for, for po pointing that out about the, uh, the, the docket. What, under what you just said though, what would be the point of having 9655 be separate from the, the other unique dockets? Would, would the reports be filed in each? With the perhaps there are stakeholders that might be interested in Potomac Edison uh, filing because you know perhaps Frederick County Maryland would only be interested in ours and so they want to participate in that docket and not in Pepco's so, plan. 
Well, would parties cross file? Like if you would you file like your report in both 9655 and then whatever the case number is for PE or and then when people file comments, do they file into both or just one? Okay. I mean, I agree that there is ambiguity because one part of the order talks about the filings in case number 9665, and then another one says that the commission will initiate unique case numbers for each utility to hold all informational DSP filings. So, I mean, it seems to me if you're going to have unique case numbers that that would be the best place to, you know, have people you know, right to avoid confusion right yeah yeah i don't i don't think potomac edison would, would be adverse to having our own technical conference because the, you know the the burden on us is going to be the same um, i would think that other stakeholders might prefer to have one technical conference um with all utilities so they can come one day and and, and participate as opposed to four different days uh deandre and then eric Yeah, right. Can you hear me? Yep, can now. Um, I just want to point out that in the commission order number 91256, uh, the commission is requiring utilities to make annual filings as to the progress of their um, the file a report with the commission uh, using the, the uh, framework that uh, template that we decide on that will provide regarding the current status of projects uh including information on planning processes and implementation that promote the clean energy goals so i believe that will be another avenue in which stakeholders will be able to provide comments including staff on dsp filings so in regards to mr bartlett's dr bartlett's question as to the available avenues in which they'll be able to provide comments to, this order here seems to provide an annual opportunity to provide those comments. Um, as it pertains to the various, um, uh, the, uh, also further in the commission order, they have said that they will um, create uh, case jackets for each company to file their DSP filings for stakeholder comments and any other additional information that will be in separate case jackets for each utility that files a plan. So these are several avenues and reasons as to why, um, um, you know, uh, well, I guess answers some questions in regards to how things ought to be handled. Uh, there will be an annual technical conference. The questions may be, we still may have the question as to whether there will be separate technical conferences, but I don't, um, being that they're, they're, all utilities are required to file these annual filings at the same time every year, that technical conference may be just one conference or not. And that may be a question you want to ask further. Well, I think the annual filings you're referring to are different than the plans. And what's, I think the- What's that? I'm the, sorry. The, the, I think that the, the filing you're talking about uh, on the template we discussed uh, when we initially started, I think those are going to be much different than the, the actual plans that are submitted and discussed. Is that your understanding? Uh, I, I, my assumption is that those plans are going to support the DSP um, plan, that those filings are going to support uh, the utilities DSP plan because they're providing the status of those pro the programs and or projects that support that plan. Okay. So what I think they're kind of tied together to some extent. Okay, that's fair. Eric. Eric, do we lose you? Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Judge, for the opportunity just to, to share my thoughts and, and comment here. What I I I recall there was some discussions early in our overall timeline here together that um, depending on where each utility is, 
whether or not there will be an alignment on those technical seminar um, sessions being on, say, the same day, the same time frame, and things of that nature. Um, I think, um, you know, if if the 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 ask is that all utilities will be um, required to, to to submit or be available for technical conferences on November first. How I think there needs to be some conversations whether or not it's achievable by all the opcos. I think flexibility um, is also important there, but understanding um, uh, DeAndre's uh, comments that you know there there are written written um, directions on how we may be able to we, we may need to proceed here that needs to be taken into consideration too. But I. I think flexibility is important here. I, I'm not sure if every, every um, utility has a planning process that will bear fruit for updates that would change on a yearly basis. That's, that's just a concern I have there. Yeah, now, and I realize we talked about flexibility and the different uh, planning um, periods of each utility and I think we'll just have to emphasize that in in our November November 15th filing that needs to be considered when thinking about whether or not these technical conferences should be annually biannually or whatever so all right um, yes dr. Bartlett yeah, thanks. And actually, I'm glad this conversation happened because it just I think that the piece that Jacob put in which says uh, that we are directed as a work group to uh, develop a proposal around the technical conference. So I think we're kind of working on that. It's not, um, I think, some of the aspects of both what it does in terms of, is it a place for active feedback in the preparation of the current plan, the current cycle, or is it only for the next cycle? Um, we need to resolve that. Um, I would refer, well, first I wanted to say, I agree with what DeAndre raised about uh, taking the reports into consideration. I also mentioned that in my written comments that um, that was one piece because we are now, the order also includes specification of the uh, annual report. So those annual reports and their content, whether it's a one-year cycle or a two-year cycle or a three-year cycle, but a, a summary review of the contents of the annual report should also be specified, I think, in here, uh, whether it's in steps one and two or whether it's in, in three, but certainly by the time you get to the technical conference, um, the content of those reports should be addressed as part of the um the discussion in the development of the next plan so i just i, I think deandre is right about that um I, I would just say that um if we look at the content in step five that the utilities have specified i think we looked at it and said that this is pretty good content um again i would my, my i would add in here that we need to look at um a summary of the key points out of the annual reports on performance to date. Um, but beyond that, it looks like pretty good content. I think we pretty much agreed on it. What we're not agreeing on is whether the commission orders and the comments actually affect that plan or only come into consideration for the next plan. But in any case, I think we're working on the task that the commission gave us, which is to develop a proposal around the annual technical conference. And I guess maybe we hadn't paid as much attention to that, but um, it seems to be important. Okay. Right. Thank you, sir. Um, just uh, Jacob and Ethan, uh, is in step five, are, are you guys open to including Dr. Bartlett's suggestion of uh, including a summary of key points and the performance? From the previous year or previous cycle, we can take that back in terms of performance. Again, I, I think that we have to figure out what do we met, what is performance. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Is that again? That's just. Uh, yeah. I'm not necessarily saying that's you know how things progressed or you know what your 
previous year like, playing like something look like since the last one yeah something like that you know you know maybe you know how far along you are in certain projects or something i don't know exactly what al's envisioning there but um because I, I know within within that we do talk about like lessons learned and process improvements okay. since the last time i think that was one of the bullet points so definitely creating space of like yeah, yeah and as we've talked about this all is going to be an iterative thing. So as yep. we improve how we engage stakeholders, how we improve our DSP mm -hmm. process, um, certainly want to be able to highlight highlight that. Okay, that's fair enough. And um, that's where I would see it fitting in too. Where okay, excellent. All right, changing. good. All right. So, anything more on the straw man? All right. So. From what I gather on this, Jacob, you guys are going to maybe clean up, uh, not say clean up, maybe clarify some some of the language in step six and uh, consider, you know, what might be included in terms of, again, I'm, I'm just using performance, but that's just my uh, term. I'm not saying that it's going to be measured, but just kind of how how the how things progress, what, what it looked like. Uh, and, what you did versus what the plan was, something like that. We can look to to see how that can be incorporated. Obviously, you know, like I've said, a lot yep. of this is more focused on the the longer term and the forecast and everything. I get it. And then there are I other areas to evaluate kind of performance and what actually happened. So okay, fair enough. All right. Um, and to the extent you guys could do that in red line, that'd be great. All right. Okay, so now we can go to um the consensus and partial consensus items um that uh the utilities the joint utilities um filed comments on and uh dr bartlett's uh, responses there too so um jacob do we just want to kind of walk through these i know dr bartlett didn't comment on everything but um, why don't we just walk through them and if folks want to jump in, um, feel free to. Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll start just kind of going down the list and Ethan, feel free to jump in if you want to take any of these. Uh, around the transmission PGM DERQ, I know there's been some back and forth of should that be incorporated or should that be considered, should that not be considered? Um, and I think, um, I think where we were trying to, the, the point we were trying to communicate with this paragraph and i know al kind of um had some questions around just clarity around the, the the terms but i think what we're trying to communicate is if there are der's that are ultimately looking to participate in pjm but are interconnecting on the distribution system they have to go through our interconnection process and so we would have insight into them and would be able to consider that in terms of as part of our forecast and so i think uh, David brought up the point last week around FERC order 2222. And so any of those devices that would be interconnecting as part of that would be, I, I think, seen and visible through the interconnection process that we have. Um, and so I think what we're trying to say is they would be reflected in our forecast as much as we would have visibility into the ones that are interconnecting into our systems. Okay. Thank you, sir. And uh, Mr. Kate and I, I would I'm not sure if you had an opportunity to read Dr. Bartlett's comments, but he kind of drafted you to respond here. Yes, he did, didn't he? <laughs> uh, so uh, I, the, I'm trying to actually find the actual uh, wording again in the uh, Exelon's. Uh, could you point me to the exact wording, uh, at what page? And then I can provide a reaction uh, because there was some uh, lack, lack of clarity I wanted to address. Sure. I'm looking at. Um, I, I think if we're talking, are you talking about the comments that they filed on the first, on the the third? Yeah, the third electron utilities uh, partial consensus and on. Sure. Yeah, it was filed on October third, um, and it's the first item under partial and non-consensus items transmission PJM DERQ. And I, I can forward it to you again, sir. Yeah, I'm just not, you know, it, I'm, I mean, I'm looking at the wrong document is what I'm it's, thinking. I'm, it's uh, no problem. Uh, let me just find it. But uh, the main issue while you're doing that, I, I remember the conversation, uh, looking at the uh, um, Al's comments was that 
I it was there was a little bit of a uh, I, I way it was phrased was un unclear, and it was referring to the PGM DERQ, and then it was talking about the joint the utilities in their connection processes. And so those are two separate things. Uh, and so I was unclear on what was being referenced there. Um, and then my other comment on that is uh, there are not all, according to the first use policy that was put into order 2003, 2006, back in several decades ago, uh, the first uh, uh, attachment onto the distribution system to sell into the wholesale market is subject to state interconnection rules. It's not subject to PGM, you know, uh, queues. The next DER that is wants to do the same thing on the same feeder and uh, and circuit is now subject is now that line has essentially been federalized for interconnection purposes and is subject to PGM queues. So it was the lack of clarity in that paragraph is what I was I was working off of. Okay. Is there any response from utilities on you know what, what's are they aware of the first use policy? I will say it's not necessarily my area of expertise, um, but we can certainly take it back and, and talk with some additional folks within the org. Can you explain the first use policy real fast? All right, I'll say it again. Um, in, if, in orders 2003 and 2006, and uh, there's a, for the whole uh, uh, case in up in ISO New England uh, on this issue, and it's also referenced inside of order number 2222. Uh, the, the way it, it works is that when a DER is seeking to uh, interconnect at the distribution system to sell into the wholesale market, the first time that a, a DER is at, uh, connecting to a distribution uh, feeder or, or circuit, and there is no other DER in location in that spot or on that feeder, it is subject to state interconnection rules, not, not the PGM. This does not go into the PGM queue. If, what, now, once that is now operational, that line is now subject to uh, federal uh, interconnection rules and therefore be subject to the PGM queue for any later, you know, uh, DER. Was that clear enough? Yeah, I, I thank you for the re-explanation. I'm, now I'm trying to understand what that what that matters here. <laughs> Honestly, I'm, I'm not making the connection to. No, if, no. If we know it's interconnected. We know it's interconnecting. We it goes through our interconnection process. I'm going to assume that our interconnection team follows these rules. What what is our action item here? If the issue was that my recollection, I'm reading this earlier was there was a reference in the first and the third pair, uh, sentences. One we talked about the PGM DERQ, and then later talked about the utility interconnection. It sounded like there was an a uh, a conflation that those are the same thing. Okay. Um. I I don't think we were conflating them. I think what we were trying to say is, if it was if it's interconnecting to the distribution system, even if it's looking to participate in the PJM market, we would still have visibility into that interconnection because it would have to go through our interconnection process. Um, and so I don't yeah. think we we're trying to conflate the two the two cues necessarily, but that. If it was participating in the wholesale, we we would still see that interconnection request. Yeah, that, I, I, that further I, I, if I, was meant to uh, indicate is that we were changing gears from the PJM to the inter, the uh, distribute from the transmission to the distribution system is the the use it, of the transition further. It's just seeking more clarity in the statements here because it was not clear that that paragraph. Okay, if you would uh, like to clean it up, you'd be happy to take your edits. <laughs> okay, happy to dig, do that then. All right. Uh, just to be clear while I have the, the mic. Uh, yeah, go ahead, in, sir. The, in uh, order 2222, the, uh, the, the, the order states that any DER that's being aggregated, you know, it, it's part of an aggregation, is not subject to any uh, 
uh, FERC jurisdictional interconnection is right. only subject to state interconnection. So an individual DER would be, you know, uh, subject to, you know, any of the rules that would be specified in, you know, at, by the state uh, PSC. And so, and, and I, you're entirely correct, Ethan. Uh, there, in order to participate in an aggregation, you know, there would be a, a utility requirement is that the DER have an interconnection agreement. So they will necessarily have to be visibility. The utility will have to know what is being interconnected. The question is rules. Okay, Ethan Jacob, you guys good on that? Before we, I guess we'll wait to see what what they uh, what um, uh, Mr. Kathan proposes. Um, Eric, and then Dr. Bartlett. Yes, thanks. I was just uh, trying to get some clarity um, just behind uh, um, what David David was sharing a minute ago, because um, I'm I was a I was left a little bit confused, right? Um, but from my my understanding, is all interconnection on the distribution side goes um, utilizes the the Maryland interconnection process right that you you can't aggregate what's on the distribution system if it hasn't been interconnected on the state rules right and I, it's pardon me go ahead i was just saying you're, you're correct on the aggregation part right and it's the it's the aggregation that is at the FERC slash pjm level not the actual um individual um assets that are being aggregated um so okay so the, the the piece that um was also a little bit concerning is when he, it's it, i was inferring that you know there was a pierce um the way you made the comment that there was a pierce of um what pjm could be asking for at the distribution level, right? And um, that was a little bit confusing to me. I just wanted to see if if that's what you were stating or 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 uh, things were being kept at the aggregation level with PGM slash um, for 2222. So to answer that, uh, we're not talking about aggregation, you know, in this part, you were correct on that. If the issue mm -hmm. is like a two megawatt or five megawatt uh, asset, mm -hmm who was mm -hmm. thinking to interconnect on the distribution system individually to, yes. to, to partic participate directly into the wholesale market. Okay. That where the first use policy applies. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, Dr. Bartlett. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and uh, this was, the discussion I was hoping you would y'all would have. Uh, I do wonder if the last sentence in that paragraph, based on on what David said, um, maybe needs some rethinking. So further, if a DER project is interconnecting to the distribution grid for participation in PJM, it must go through the joint utilities interconnection process. From what David said, if it were the second project on a line, then it would go uh, through the PJM interconnection process, if if I'm understanding correctly. If it was the first project, it would go through the uh, the joint utilities interconnection. If it was uh, the second project on a line that was already um, delivering into the market, then um, it would have to go through the PJM queue. Is that not correct? David, uh, that is correct, and I'm just I was wondering if the utility going to respond. Yeah. And so, hope, hopefully, uh, um, Mr. Kathan will clean that up, and uh, we can put that one to bed. All right. Anything more on this item? And I, I don't know if uh, he volu if uh, Dr. Bartlett volunteered you for anything else, but I uh, appreciate you um, offering to do the clarifications on that one. All right. Uh, next one, policy priorities. Uh, yeah, the policy priorities, I think this was a question that was around 
incorporation into short term or, or different things like that. And I think um, what we're trying to say here really is short term is always influenced by that medium and long term, right? Al, I think, described it as a Russian doll style situation. And so those policy priorities are certainly incorporated within the short term because there's that natural kind of waterfall effect of if we're incorporating them in the long term, that feeds the medium term, which feeds the short term. There's certainly some things that can also be turned around faster, like customer programs um, in a more kind of short medium term uh, situation. And so those customer programs can more quickly evolve to support policy priorities and be stood up to support uh, policy pr priorities. But as you then think about investments in infrastructure and the actual kind of distribution system, those projects take longer. Being able to incorporate those is really where you start to see incorporation in the, the long and medium term start to feed into um, that short term. And so I guess long way of saying is, is yes, there is incorporation in the short term, whether it's through water falling down and the Russian doll effect of incorporating it earlier, as well as there are different types of things that could be stood up in the short term, but less so in the infrastructure space, more in kind of like the customer program space. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, Al, do you want to weigh in on this? Kind of looks like you're no, I, I, I thought that this was a, a useful section, um, including the- They the, all are. That, They're well, all they, equally important. They're all really useful, right? <laughs> um, but I just wanted to, 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 again, thinking in terms of we're in the regulation development phase, right? And so this point about the need for clear guideline, guidelines to, to demonstrate prudency um, is something that we, again, it, it's just pushing for um, for clarity, the kind of the level of clarity that we're going to need as we specify uh, things in regulation. And this that that requirement that the utilities have captured here, I thought, is important for us to keep in mind as we uh, move towards that process. I also flag here there are my latter set of comments are include this one about alignment of utility earnings with incentives and other things about incentives and compensation that were mentioned in other places. And I do want us to talk about that at the end. Oh, absolutely, sir. Absolutely. Uh, Jacob and then DeAndre. Jake, J O. Okay. Th thank you. Yeah. I, I, I don't think that this was a, uh, a major component of your, this policy priority uh, paragraph, but I did want to comment on the sentence that, that, that um, Dr. Bartlett just, you know, just referred to about aligning utility planning uh, cost effectively with policy goals will require alignment of utility earnings and incentives. I mean, for, for I mean, I guess you know if, if a particular like you know PIM is being proposed, you know, OPC will certainly consider. It, but you know, the, the idea as OPC sees it, we're going to be setting policy goals and the, the utilities are going to go out and, and they're going to meet that. And then their compensation will be the rates that that they charge. Um, and so I think our initial view is that we're going to be skeptical about any incentive that results in extra payment to the utility for something that the commission has directed them to do or, that, you know, that, that that they're obligated to do under their, um, you know, under their, their, their franchise obligations. Um, and 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 I, I will caveat that by saying, you know, it, I guess it, it, if if incentives includes negative incentives, then I think OPC would agree. If we, you know, if we had goals that had uh, a penalty if they weren't met, then I think we would agree that that is a way to align, um, you know, uh, utility earnings with, with 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 incentives in a way that would, you know, be directed at achieving those policy goals. All right. Uh, thank you, Sir DeAndre. Yes, um, I think uh, we might uh, we might have initiated some. Uh, 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 we we uh, well from our previous comments, we asked for some clarification of the short, mid, and long term plans. So um, we, um, I am happy with the utilities response. I have a better understanding. Um, my my question is um, with the onset of. Well, according to the energy storage targeted uh, work group, they're going to recommend they're recommending a phase one of energy storage programs, um, which uh, they are recommended, which they recommended in their most recent filing and will probably be active, I think, either somewhere between 2025 and 2026. Um, so with 
the um, with your com comments in regards to changing or uh, adjusting some existing uh, programs and initiatives for customers in the short term. Do you all see any issues with implementing these new energy storage programs? Or will they be able to fit into the short term um, planning process? Uh, Eric, I'm, I'm, I'm oh, guessing you want to answer unless JB wants to. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks. Was was that a direct question to the to the utilities? It didn't sound like it was rhetorical. Yeah, yeah, it was. A, it was. <laughs> I, yeah, that was a direct question, and I I just want to get a, a gauge as to if you all are. I'm, I'm sure you all are aware of that, but do you all see any difficulty in implementing these? phase one energy storage programs so in in regards to what is happening in the storage the storage program I think, uh, eric if i may put a break on this we're actually in the middle of developing comments that will be filed um november 7th on this issue um i i would prefer we we are going to su submit substantial comments on this issue and i, I think that this is probably not the appropriate time to weigh in on that until we're done we can't get a sneak peek um well i'm not necessarily asking for extensive comments just if you all we've got a 250 page report to write comments on and um so so, so uh, ethan is a little bit more direct with than than i i was planning on there but we are we are aligned right in 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 the thought there my my you know what i was going to to suggest is in alignment with ethan that there is activities happening at the storage level there are things that are being discussed there i would i would um, recommend that we allow for that to play out on the storage side right um, because there's a working group and everything that's associated with that so i think if we give it a chance to work out um in in the information will will come come to fruition in a timely manner if if you don't mind deandre i, I wanted to answer your question directly all right all right so yeah, no problem ahead, yeah. uh, right. no problem i understand um yeah. we we'll, we'll just like to keep in mind that we have to align all of those other programs with what's going on in here and 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 um to to that piece the reason why one of my hand my hand was up earlier was to um try to pull on the string from um jacob oh he he mentioned metrics and things of that nature earlier right uh i i wanted to 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 just pull on the string if he could just give an example right what was he thinking about when he mentioned um you know metrics for the the utilities to achieve if if you could just give give an example to help us understand um the mindset there right so I, my, my comment about the metrics was to distinguish why the 9353 process might differ from what mm -hmm. what we would do here because i i do think that it's not going to be as easy to have the like a safety number for distribution system planning right well if, if part of that could be my ignorance because i'm not a technical expert but i, I like it, it it seemed to me as, as i recall the development of safety and safety and all those things you know it it, it it's it's much, much more objective than i think aspects of distribution system planning will be so i think there is um going to be a discussion of metrics later on so i mean I, I think what we've been talking about is what opc understands the metrics that we would you know be discussing um and putting in regulations would include um but you know my reference to metrics earlier was basically saying that the ninth the um you know reliability metrics are much more self-contained and probably that that model might not be actually the best for what for distribution system planning notwithstanding the commission's order to the contrary um and that that's the only reason i brought it up okay thanks um hey. I'm sorry, and I would like to add just to your question, um, Eric, um, that in previous comments, staff has um, expressed 
a, 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 a non-consensus in regards to the metrics that were proposed by the by the metric subgroup and is currently working on a proposal for some uh, that um, to uh, metrics to DSP to the DSP process. Um, so um, yeah, so in regards to that, we you know, and similar to what Jacob has stated, you know, we don't see how safety, safety, and KD numbers, which are some of the metrics that were proposed and directly relate to this DSP process that's going on here. So we're 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 part. We're currently working on um, proposing some new or uh, uh, metrics for consideration. Okay, thanks. I'm 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 happy to hear that, DeAndre. And you know, just just for clarity, right? Is I I think we we think it, but we don't say it. So I'm I'm gonna hope that me saying it out aloud helps to align us all. As as a utility, right? I know there are targets out there for amount of EVs that are on the system. Um, as utilities, we are doing everything possible to enable our system um, to to interconnect um, fleet and fleet and, and all the EVs that our customers need. But the utilities, um, we we don't control customers going out and buying EVs, right? In addition to that, um, you know, customers deciding to put PV on their roofs and things of that nature, as much as we, we, we socialize that, um, you know, this these are the things we're driving towards and we do the interconnections and we do the approvals and, and, and all of that. A customer making that decision, right? Um, we, we have no control over that, right? Um, so as we are thinking about metrics for the utilities, I think it is important that we think about metrics that are within the control of the utilities, right? And 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 I just wanted to put that out there from a a expectation setting, right? And just to get it out in the air and open so everyone <laughs> um, hears it. But thank you, because um, it was a little bit concerning to me when um, Jacob O was speaking to, to metrics. And yes, we have metrics from a reliability perspective that we can measure and things that looks in the rear view. But as we look in the, um, the, the windscreen, right, the windshield, there's, there's different ways we're going to have to rethink of that. All right. I'll pause. I see Ethan's hand is up. He, he usually, of uh, course, corrects me. Uh, may I go ahead, Your Honor? Oh, yeah, yeah, that was your cue. Great. First off, uh, Eric, that's, uh, I wanted to jump in on the comments just because that I know our lawyers who are currently off on another uh, call right now would, would have, wouldn't want us to comment on comments that we're about to make. So mm -hmm. but, uh, you were definitely on the right track there, and your comments on metrics were fully aligned. Um, what I did want to roll back to, though, uh, Mr. Auslander, uh, you actually just surprised me. Um, with your comments about uh, aligning utility earnings uh, and recovery with uh, policy goals, because uh, often the Office of People's Council's comments about our work are framed in that we are incentivized to overbuild, to we're our incentives are wrong, and uh, I, so I, I was surprised that you didn't want to find a way to to realign our incentives, which. From my point of view, as a, a someone working in the grid mod space, is one of the, the our central goals. Uh, um, can you expand on OPC's views on on changing utility earnings and why you would not want to align us with pol state policy goals? I'm I'm very curious about this. Yeah, you know, I don't want to take us too far afield, but my uh, the, the, my comment was directed specifically at the sentence at the end of the first paragraph in the policy priority section number two. And I just wanted to, you know, even though I, I understand that this is not like the core like concept of this of this section, but to the extent that this sentence is suggesting that we, you know, that the the DSP process would include some type of extra like incentive payment to the utility to compensate them for uh, work that they do, investments that they make in furtherance of 
you know, state policy goals that they're directed to to do, I think is inappropriate. So to the extent that that is captured in here, OPC does not support that. But I, if, I, if you're talking about generally that we need to find a way to align utility uh, in, in interest with uh, the public interest more effectively, totally agree. Well, I mean, you know, a great example is, you know, the current tension with, you know, uh, you know, uh, gas, gas infrastructure. And, you know, you can say we want you to decarbonize and we can say we'd love to decarbonize, but we have an obligation to serve. And we still see continued growth in demand from customers for gas. What do we, you know, if we don't change the incentives there and the regulate the regulatory structure, then what are we going to do? Yes, we can say yes, we agree with you, but we can and we can offer incentives to customers to make transition, but to electric for electrification, like in you know, in projects like our our network geothermal that we're pilot we're starting, but you know, without some alignment, I, I don't see how we get to the goal. So honestly, you know, uh, Jacob, I don't want to argue this, I, but I would ask you to take back to your team and perhaps think through some areas where we could work uh, work together on this because, you know, this is, uh, GridMod is, you know, my, my what I do every day thinking about these problems and I don't see how we get to a, you know, to the meeting state goals without realigning the incentives. And, you know, I, I really encourage you to take that back. Well, I mean, I guess I could, but I, I mean, so I understand what you're saying. What, what, when you say align, you know, utility, what, what are you talking about? What, what kind of incentives are you referring to? Well, you know, I was just mentioning the gas. Um, not another great, you know, we, we had a good conversation last time about, um, and, and we're going to touch on this later, but you know how meeting rapid electrification and uh, you know a load that unexpected load is very difficult for us if we are, we can't because of prudency and because of the stranded cost problem. Finding ways to to address those, finding ways to for us to present more, you know, to support decarbonization efforts more. There's a lot of, um, you know, that's what I think of this distribution system planning process, you know, where we should be going. We, we've been talking for two years now really about hosting capacity and load forecasting, but I think there is a lot more low-hanging fruit that we're missing if we don't think about the incentives, about what makes them, what a utility is paid to do to, and, you know, we would be changing some of that. And that I, I, I really encourage you to take that back to your team and think that think through where we could work together more on this. That's I, I'll leave it at that. I appreciate well, your yeah, I, like I said, I don't want to I think we're, we're going a little bit you know far afield. But I, I think for what you just said, it, it goes back to the point that I made at the beginning of this conversation that, if you know, if, if there was like a specific PIM that was being proposed, that's one thing. Obviously, o, o, OPC would, you know, would consider. But to the extent okay. that it's just a general statement about that it's very important for us to always think about how to like give utilities extra incentives to accomplish these state goals. OPC does not agree with that as a general statement. Okay. Well, you know, M is what we were, one of the things we were alluding to there. So that's a good start. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Let's uh, we'll go to Joyce and then Al and then uh, put this one to bed and move on. Yeah, I, I won't belabor it either, but the PIM conversation is one, yes, not necessarily for this forum, but MEA is interested. I think we filed in some comments. We're not only interested, but we're also wanting to do a deeper dive. I think we've said that out loud and empower and kind of put some put some numbers together, put some proposals together and move this conversation forward, not here. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Bartlett. Yeah, and I just agree I, with the discussion. I think that um, I, I had flagged it to as a uh, a later discussion, but I, I think we're having it now um, about uh, prudency of investments and compensation and so on and so forth. And I did send with my comments the the, the little paper that we sent back in July about um, case nine. Uh, what's the other case that um, 
PC 51 case 9618, which I think Judge McBain, you had some role in as well, um, which has gotten tangled up a little bit with the MRP discussion, I believe. But but I agree with Ethan. This is we can't talk about the just the technical requirements of DSP without talking about um, how it interacts with the business model that we're presently working under and the incentive structure that presently exists. And that goes from everything from stride, which I consider to be an inappropriate incentive to um, the, the kind to PIMS, but also other ways of thinking about it so that we're not just, um, I mean, utilities have to, to have to, uh, to exist as businesses. And so um, if CapEx is a major um, input to their revenue, uh, but CapEx might be in conflict with some of the things with, that we're trying to do, then we have to think about that as we make regulations so that we can take that into account. So I just, this this dimension of incentives and disincentives and business model and so on really has to be part of our discussion for DSP. And I think that's what Joyce is saying as well. Um, so I just want to, uh, we, we, we can't just talk technical. We, we have to talk about how it's going to work. Okay. All right. All right, thank you, sir. All right, um, all right. I think all right. We're ready to move on. All right, the DSP reporting template. I gotta admit, I was a little surprised this was a partial. Not you guys included this. I thought we'd put this one to bed. So I think this was responding to to staff correct around uh, their proposed Excel spreadsheet template for reporting on meeting the twelve goals. Right. Um, and so I think what we were saying here was, um, I, I think we found that structure kind of overly burdensome and, and right. referenced the template that has been built for the, the utilities to use as part of their filing uh, and see that as kind of that, that first avenue for us to be able to report that information. And as we've talked about, it can be an iterative process right. for us to uh, reconsider the sufficiency of that information going forward. But Right. I, I just thought we were all on the same page as uh, what the template was going to look like. Is that? Yeah, I, I think we were, but I think okay. it, it came up last okay. meeting. All I right. Think there was a question okay. from staff. So we all right. To okay. Um, then I'll go. DeAndre, um, are we good on the utilities response and what the template should look like? DeAndre, if you're talking, you're muted. Um, uh, um, I'm sorry, but if if we could um, refresh my memory in regards to what that template, what the agreed upon template looked like. Uh, I don't or know. The, I mean, it doesn't have to be now. You can send it to me, email or okay. something. All right, I'll have to find it and I'll, I'll send it around again. All right. And I'll say what we've been working towards just a high level description of it because, like I said, we're very much in process towards building that out since we have the report by November 15th. So approaching that one month window. But for each of those 12 goals, kind of having three sections of. Mm -hmm. What are we working on? How does it connect to that goal? And, and what measurements of progress are there um, on each of those projects? And the, you know, it's the one sentence kind of high level view of it. I just forwarded it to you, DeAndre. Uh, Thank you, Ethan. I, another utility had just reached out asking for it. It was right on my top of my folders. Um, and Thank just you. wanted to let you know that we are actually populating this right now. Um, it's uh, I, we have actually I have a meeting BG and E I'm running this afternoon with the, the team that's populating the, the the template so we're you know we're we're in motion to get to to filing on the 15th of November. Great, thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Bartlett. Yeah, I was just going to add. I think that um, uh, Jacob, in his three sentences, summarized it pretty well, and and we understood that. For this first run, because and particularly since DeAndre is saying there, there's work going on on, on uh, revising the metrics part of it, but we understood that not all the metrics that might be desired would be able to be included in this run. But the idea of of getting it started 
and growing into it, I guess, um, was what we had agreed upon, but that the template, and I think this is what the paragraph says, that, that the, the utilities would do their best to use this template and we will, we will grow into it. All right, great. All right, so hopefully we can put that one to bed. All right, DER number four, um, rather than run through all of them, Jacob, you just wanna hit the ones that uh, Dr. Bartlett referred to and I'm looking at four one four three and four five sure i can touch on those um four one is around uh modeling for der adoption and so i think we um are supportive of developing processes for der modeling der adoption incorporating those into our der forecast we highlighted some of the other um, additional ways that can be used to capture some of this information besides just a forecast uh, like outreach to different customers um, um and being able um to identify them that way in addition to a, a der forecast and also just kind of note that um, a key thing for for some ders to be able to kind of be fully incorporated is that they have to be you know dispatchable and so um you know that's what was for four one and i guess i'll pause there and then we can okay. just all right dr bartlett you want to weigh in sir um, yeah, sure. If if um, if you go back to look at uh, Julia Geraldo's presentation, um, she was talking about something that was more advanced, I guess, than than the kind of examples that were given in this. In this um, because, for example, consideration of additional large loads, that's what the utilities do now. Um, that is, I think, what she would define as reactive, um, whereas um if you look at the slides she evolves into the a more complex approach to modeling which actually um looks at some of the ways that you can uh model um uptake of particular ders whether it's evs or, or batteries or whatever um you can look at spatial analysis and so on i mean that's the grid that we're moving toward is going to require that. And I just didn't want to leave us with um, this more reactive um, definition of, um, of forecasting that uh, really seemed to be quite short of the kind of thing that um, I think some other utilities are already doing, but uh, that, that we should be moving towards to take into consideration the complexity of the uh, of the grid or of the of the system really the electric system uh, that we're moving toward and uh, that's all I just wanted to flag that 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 the examples that were given sort of didn't move us into that more uh, complicated but necessary kind of modeling all right. All right. thank you sir Ethan you want to go ahead sir yeah I just uh, dr. Barlow is that the Kevala Kavala, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Presentation. Yeah, it's. Okay. Um, I think I'm, I may have cited yeah. this slide. Okay, I, I would just like to point out, um, and this is one of the, one of the things I think is a disadvantage of the work group situation is Kavala. One of my uh, one of my colleagues is giving me a pronunciation guide, and <laughs> um, just like to point out that um, they are a vendor of those technologies, and one of the um, difficulties of the uh, work group process is sometimes uh, we do receive advertisements in the form of a presentation. Um, we have gone with, you know, as we indicated in that sample report that we, uh, sample of the CSNA report for November 15th, we have chosen a technology and the capabilities are being built out and uh, there is a lengthy description there. And I just like to caution the work group from, um, you know, remember that the, it, oftentimes when someone comes and says that a, something is needed very much, it's because they sell it. So, uh, and you know, we will make uh, we will make choices based on uh, our system needs, and you know, when we do a bid process for vendors, what we select that meets those needs most of all. Thanks, Ethan. I think the point, Ethan, was to recognize the need. Um, not necessarily to sell the Kevlar product, but um, 
I mean, the utilities sell things too, right? So we're all in that together. But uh, yeah, I think the idea was that what kind of projection is necessary to do with the complexity of the grid as it evolves, um, not necessarily to, um, I'm not sure that she specified a model, but in any case, uh, it's, it's the capacity not the how. I think we've had this discussion a couple of times now that that we want to be able to to specify the capabilities that utilities need to have, not tell them how to do it. So if you have different software, that's fine. But um, I think it's the re what are the requirements that a modernized grid is going to um, have in order to be appropriately planned and managed. That's it. It, real quick, Judge, I just want to add to kind of Ethan's no, comments there. I, I think, Al, we, we have, and we may not have just fully reflected it here in these comments, but it, in previous comments when we've talked about kind of how we envision the future of DER forecasting, I think it is envisioned towards moving towards that more, a more complex version of, of doing some type of modeling to support that DER forecast. And I think we were just trying to highlight here some of the additional ways that we can have some of those conversations to identify those things, especially different things like data centers, trying to have some of those conversations. Um, I can't tell you how to cite or, or where data centers are necessarily gonna cite until having some of those conversations are important inputs into that. Um, but certainly looking at DERs in general, um, I think we're supportive of moving towards that and have communicated that as, as part of our comments before. And so I think we are just kind of reflecting some, some of the other pieces in these comments. All right, so it doesn't sound, I don't wanna say we're talking by one another, but it seems like we're kind of on the same page, maybe same church wrong pew, maybe. So. Okay, all right, DeAndre. Uh, DeAndre, if you're talking, you can't hear you, you're muted. Uh, sorry about that. Um, uh, my question, uh, these, this, uh, in regards to this forecasting and the comments submitted by the joint utilities, are these uh, comments uh, or these sentiments shared amongst the other utilities, such as Potomac, Edison, and Semeco, in regards to this forecast uh, as uh, DER and low forecasting? I would presume not, unless you know they say otherwise. I don't want to. I don't want to assume. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. my point. That we didn't. I don't. I, I don't know. I just want to get a, a understanding of what they're, where they stand in regards to these comments, because from my understanding, these comments are from um, right. yeah. EGE, Pepco, and Del Mar. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Damon. Yeah, no, thanks, DeAndre. I appreciate you raising the question. I would say that we're still working through some some of these. As I think has been indicated, we just don't have the bandwidth and the resources to spend as much time as we would certainly like on some of these issues. So we're trying to work through it and digest it. I think a lot of what's there we, we certainly do align with. Um, and as we sort of work through the report that's due in November, I'm sure that will help solidify some of our thoughts as we try to piece through the details. Um, so it's a good question. I'm not sure I have a great answer at this point. So I apologize for that. No, that's no apology necessary. It is what it is. We get it. Um, and, and your your answer was fine. Uh, uh, Dave. Yeah, this is uh, Dave from Potomac Edison. We're in the same situation as Smeco. We're still working right. through some of it. Figured it. All right. Thank you, sir. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's understood. Uh, we just, we hadn't heard anything from you all. And I think it would help if we just understand where you all stand and even if it's different or um i think the commission pretty much understands based on their their orders that they see that utilities are in a different uh stand at a different uh, uh, uh capabilities in, in in some of these areas so just having an understanding of where you all stand and so that we can move forward with some regulations and or um you know some recommendations that accommodate all utilities in improving in this uh, in specific areas. Uh, thanks, go ahead. Damon. Go ahead, jump back in, yeah, sir. Just to follow up on on one point there, I know I've said this before, but I'll, I'll iterate it again. At least with respect to Smeco, certainly the law now requires consideration of the differences between the utilities. So, no, I appreciate DeAndre your thought that 
we need to we need to come up with something that works for everyone and at the same time it needs to we need to ensure that it does recognize the, the differences between the types of utilities across the state the state and again the law requires us to do as such now um so that is important um and, and i don't want to you know re-engage the discussion but certainly the conversation earlier about incentives and things like that that's not of interest for example to, to smeco as a, as a non-profit cooperative however what is important is to make sure that we are we are being mindful of the financial health and well-being of the cooperative which means that there is a a an appropriate cost recovery mechanism so that our customers are not unduly penalized down the road so that that's important for us so that's a very important consideration and um and that that could mean some sort of contemporaneous cost recovery mechanism um i, I mean i certainly disagree with the notion that was articulated earlier that stride we're not a gas company but stride is not an incentive mechanism it's a it's a contemporaneous cost recovery mechanism and so we, we may need something in place simply to maintain the financial health and well-being but as a cooperative, we're not looking for an incentive like a PIM because we don't have shareholders. So again, different construct for us. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, yes, sir, Dr. Bartlett. Yeah, thanks. Again, a, a really important discussion. Um, and we, we've talked about the flexibility issue a, a bunch of times for the different utilities and the co-ops. Um, it's going to be really, I'm not sure, we do need to be able to specify in regulation certain capabilities, I believe. But again, this definition of, of the flexibility for different utilities or the co-ops to, to implement is important. And in some cases, we don't want to specify things that are just not going to be implementable by them. So it's really going to have to be, we're going to have to get nitty gritty about this at some point um as we talk about specifics of regulation um what are the limits of what can be specified uh because of this need for for flexibility or differentiation between the utilities um so i just want to make that point um and the same thing with this consideration of incentives and so on that this really um we're going to have to get specific about that I also just didn't want to leave this point without talking about this statement that uh, DER forecasts can only be incorporated in capacity planning if they are dispatchable. Um, that one, it, it seemed to me, and I talk, I've talked with a couple of other people who are more technical, um, is an overstatement or perhaps incorrect because there certainly will be non-dispatchable um ders on the system that will affect um load and load shape and that uh should be considered even if they are not under the utilities controls i don't think this is an accurate statement but other people who are more technical than i but again i've talked to a few people and uh they agree that that that's a limitation um that is probably overstated can you tell us who like we might want to talk to them. <laughs> Straighten them uh, out. Take them out. Uh, as you, as you, you know, <laughs> we're always looking for new information. This was a uh, this was a statement from uh, one of my forecasters um, who's working with the advanced technology. We've been, uh, you know, uh, I would just like to, you know, if Al could point us to a, a, an SME, that's always helpful. If we're going to have a process for stakeholder input, that would be something I would, you know, I'm going to ask this every time someone brings a, I, I talk to somebody, I'm going to ask. So get used to this kind of response if you say you've got a technical expert disagreeing with mine. <laughs> yeah, okay, let me do it offline. Okay, I appreciate, yeah. I really appreciate it. I don't mean to be aggressive here. I, you know, we, we have already been, um, you know incorporating comments that we've been receiving over the past two years and we've received a lot of interesting input that has changed our thinking and i'd like to continue that tradition so but ethan what is your response then to the um to this uh to this the point that not all ders are dispatchable 
but they still will affect um, both load and um, therefore need to be taken into consideration in capacity planning. Um, what I, you're saying that all, all it's only going to be DERs that are dispatchable, like a VPP, or um, a, say a, a large solar project on a on a line that is not under the control of the utilities, but still affects uh, load and capacity. Um, you're saying that those those things that are not directly under utility control won't be considered in planning. Okay, we may have created a bit of a muddle here, but we were drawing out the difference between forecasting and figuring out what's going to happen on the system and the ability to dispatch and actually impact the forecast proactively is, is what this sentence is meant to, to convey, which may be causing some confusion. Um, I see Eric Henlon is raising his hand. He should probably take this. I'm, I'm admittedly doing a bit of a dance <laughs> on his behalf. So Eric, please explain this on behalf of our capacity planning team. Good morning again. Thanks, Ethan. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll share. I don't always get it right, but I do try. Um, I think with this with this um, line that we are, you know, sentence or what that we are discussing, it's trying to draw the difference in that, especially for solar, right? On most of the feeders, right? Um, and the BG system, we see we see our peaks when the sun is down, right? So solar provides no support from a capacity perspective because our peaks are are, are usually after sundown, right? Um, hence, um, so having something like battery, which is dispatchable, right, would provide support to peaks that are available during that period of time, right? And I think that's the, um, what we were trying to draw as an example in that um, statement. And if someone can point it, Ethan, we'll, we'll discuss where that statement was made offline. Well, let, get, let David go and then I, I just re respond to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, thank you for that, Eric. That was, uh, I thought that might be the right response on that. So uh, my, in the issue is that, you know, there, uh, you are exactly correct that uh, in, if the peak is happening in the evening, solar ne won't necessarily provide much capacity. You know, there's two comments. One is that, you know, even in uh, PJM, the uh, intermittent or non-dispatchal resources do get an, a, an ELCC capacity accreditation. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is some rec reflection of that. Then secondly, um, I hear what you're saying about the dispatchable storage, but mm -hmm. you know, there may be on the DER system, whether it's going to be an EV or whether that's going to be uh, a someone putting in their Tesla power walls or mm -hmm. whatever, they may be shifting their load mm -hmm. such that, you know they're they are not consuming during mm -hmm. the the evening so what we are you know i think just this statement needs to be clarified or explained it better mm -hmm. you know it, it's too broad and too specific at the way it's phrased out okay understood thanks okay. and i i would agree with that and i'll just leave it there okay Thank you. Thank you very much for your feedback, uh, Mr. Catherine and Ms. Dr. Martin. Okay. All right. And I'm just going to mark that one as a potential follow up for the utilities to address the broadness of the statement. And maybe Ethan and uh, Dr. Bartlett's uh, experts can hash it out. All right. Um, uh, Jacob, are we on to 4.3? Yeah, I think 4.3 um, around bottom-up kind of forecasting. I think we said we uh, currently use um, that feeder substation transformer substation level data right. as well as informed by AMI data. 
Um, so certainly, um, I, I think in support of that statement, I think, Al, I think not to put words in your mouth, but I think recognize that and had more questions around just kind of uh, broader applicability across the state. Yeah, what 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 Jacob said is right. That's all I was questioning. I I understand. I appreciate the fact that the the excellent utilities are are using AMI data. I believe we have heard from um, some of the other utilities they don't have that data. P does not. <clears throat> and so uh, the question becomes again. This this is the discussion we just had about what should regulations specify, and if they specify that such data should be considered but recognize that some utilities don't have it is it fair to specify that and if we think it's essential to specify it how do we provide the flexibility for those utilities to develop that capacity um so those are just things we need to be thinking about as we develop regulations All right. <clears throat> i mean i would hope that maybe we could just again i'm just thinking out loud um put it in a something early on in the regs, you know, that that provides that flexibility in terms of something like AMI, you know, to the extent it applies, to the extent the utility doesn't have a particular capability that they don't necessarily have to comply with. But, but again, I'm just thinking out loud. All right, um, 4.5, Jacob. Yeah, I think this one's around PGM system level loading or system level forecast versus distribution system level forecasting. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a desire to have them coordinated. And so you know, we, we have the position that we don't necessarily agree that they should be so tightly coupled. They're, they're looking to kind of achieve different goals, mm -hmm. right? D distribution level forecasting is really focused on identifying those local system constraints, right? Hence why some of that local or bottoms up building and looking at the, the system at that local level where that system level view from PJM is a lot more about what are the maximum energy needs across the system. Um, and so they're really kind of focused on different things. And so because there's that different, different focus, we, we, we don't necessarily um, believe that they should be tightly coupled. All right. Dr. Bartlett? Yeah, I guess or, I or, or, yeah. so what? I just thought that um, this was a, maybe a, a different interpretation of, of what was in that presentation. Uh, which was really focused on distribution system load and DER forecasting, uh, because the you know the the load is going to the the nature of the load spatial distribution variability so on is going to uh, be a local factor as the grid evolves, and so I believe that that's what. Um, was being talked about the the utilities the pjm load forecast as i understand it is basically what jacob just said it's a, the total amount of energy that the utilities are responsible for procuring or gain getting in meeting in some way um but as we evolve the grid and it becomes um there's going to be differential um in different segments of the grid uh, there are going to be uh, different requirements and so uh, local I guess distribution system load planning was I believe what was being referred to here and is something that I, I think is uh, different now that might there may be some tension with the way PJM projects it and I think it's been suggested that it would be good if those two things actually were better coordinated, but I don't think that's what this paragraph is about. The question was about um, how does load planning happen, and it would link. It would need to be connected to um, DER forecasting uh, in at the distribution system level, um, which is I. That was the point. I think that the PJM thing is 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 a almost a separate category okay all right uh thank you uh david now I'll come back to you jacob uh just really more of a question to the utilities which is uh i understand there's two different you know, uh forecasting you know, that you're doing and the question is uh i think uh, my if you're doing it at the local level and you know isn't there a summation of all of those local levels that comes up to a system load 
forecast that you as the distribution utility it will have? And is that separate, you know, than one that PJM is doing? And are, which shouldn't you be planning for and looking and making plans based on that summation of all the local ones? And it's more of a question. I don't know how you guys do this process. Um, you can do the aggregate system peak. And, you know, bear in mind that means that you're going to have peaks that some areas that are peaks in the morning, you're going to have 5 p.m. peaks in some areas, you're going to have 7 p.m. peaks in others, you're going to have noon peaks in some places. And so the aggregate system peak uh, becomes a single point of the ultimate peak, but it, it does erase all those individual peaks that we actually plan individual pieces of our system for. For instance, me here in Rockville, the theater on in my, in, here in Rockville is very residential as opposed to downtown DC or downtown Baltimore, which had different peaks. Um, if you aggregate to a system level, you get one peak. Then you move to the PJM level and you're actually looking at an aggregation that is even larger than an individual utility often. And we do use them as a cross check. And I can say that bg and &E has its own um, separate forecast of customer load that is not the the um, customer demand, which is a different cross check that we also do. And PHI, but on the other hand, BGE doesn't really do a system load up. Uh, PHI, I believe, still does for my time there. Eric may be about to correct me. Um, but at the end of the day, the PJM, planning the PJM, there isn't a lot of use for it for system level planning. What we need to know is how much we will need to purchase at top, at peak the worst day of the year for our customers to meet their, which means we need to have the ability to bring that in, which is the PJM's job. So there, there isn't a huge matchup there as far as except, you know, kind of a, a cross check, thumbs up, thumbs up, everything matches at the end of the day. Other than that, there's not a lot uh, to be gained. Uh, Eric, you want to jump in and correct me? So not not necessarily correction, Ethan, just just for clarification. Bear with me, folks. Um, usually when when I respond to questions, I think clarity is is very important. So uh, I just have an inquiring question for David um, before I respond. Um, you 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 mentioned um, that the utilities are looking at local local loads and 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 rolling up and things of that nature um are you asking the question in regards to to um the impact on on the constraints that are identified on the system the distribution system or you're asking the question in regards to um capacity needs at the um at the transmission level or the system level just, I'm trying to understand from a clarity perspective before I respond. Well, that's essentially is the question in which, you know, the PGM forecast is for the transmission and this is distribution system planning we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So purposes of distribution system planning, is there you know, an example would be, you know, could there be a cross bg e uh, DSM program, which would uh, be used to uh, reduce loads which would be across a number of different feeders, that would be part of a capacity planning, I would assume. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, I think we've we've done this a couple of times already, but I'll try to to do it again in regards to um, sharing with this group um, the interactions within BGE and the transmission planners and and their you know it it is it is interesting um the the knowledge having the knowledge of how um, pjm works with the transmission the different um transmission owners which bg and exelon is one right and how studies are performed i'm not going to make an attempt to to really delve into what that interaction is like but um the 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 local 
um, transmission owners, they do the studies and things on behalf of PJM and things of that nature and what, what the systems can do. And it's, it's, a, it's a very complex, um, um, you know, way that they, they do that. And, and, and I'm not going to get into that. But what I'll share is the interactions between the local transmission owners or the local planners and the distribution planners, right? These are, these are collaboration and stuff that has been happening um, not just it, it's it's not it's not something that's is being driven by DSP or anything. This is stuff that is ingrained in in planning and operating electric infrastructures. So there's nothing new, right, in regards to the collaboration that's go, been going on between the two teams. Um, yes, um, in a very simplified way, right? There is a roll up of the load on the system. But there are so many other things that goes into planning a distribution system and also looking at the impact on the transmission system that um, it it's it's somewhat, you know, it takes time to educate you on that. And I'll, sh I'll try to give just one, one example. When you look at constraints of the system, you always look at it from a reliability perspective too, right? Things will fail. It's not if, they will fail on the distribution system. And our job is to have a distribution system that can has the reliability to still provide the necessary energy and the power to our customers upon equipment failure. So we do analysis on the distribution side that takes those things into consideration, right? And it looks at the different reliability issues on the system and how that rolls up and the impact that it may have um, upon an abnormal condition, right? Um, to not just other pieces of the distribution system, but also the transmission system, right? Um, I don't want to bore this team with all that technical um, nuances, right? Um, what I'm trying to share here is, one, it is, it is not as simple as you have stated it, right? It takes time, and there's a reason why we can't just take someone off the road and say, here, plan the distribution system. It doesn't work. Right, it's a very hard job to find the right skill set to plan the distribution system. Right, so, and it takes studies and different knowledge of the system and understanding how the system is going to react on the different conditions. Right, so yes, the roll up, but also there are different um, when you do different types of analysis on equipment failure, how that's going to impact other distribution system and also how it impacts the transmission system. We provide this data from the distribution side. We provide this data to the transmission team that they then utilize, right? They are points of interconnection between the D and the T that they then utilize that data and they perform their studies, right? So it's very complex, um, but just wanted to, one, provide some insight. There is collaboration that goes between D, T and D. It is nothing new, right? And yes, the impacts of DER have been, um, is being taken into considerations during those uh, collaboration. Hope that provides a little bit more insight and understanding, especially as we, we, we have those conversations around um, what is happening between the T and the D planning. Does that help? That, that, thank you, uh, Eric. That was an excellent uh, discussion, and I'm, uh, it really kind of nails in understanding what thing. And thank you for the reiteration of that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not disagreeing with anything you're saying. I think the more requests I would have is just to make sure that you know that it's clear. You know, I think the statements were a little uh, broader than that, and I understand that we don't want to spend a whole you know pages describing, but I think it would be useful to just make it at this point a little clearer. And, uh, and not just rely upon words like coordination and such. 
Uh, so and with that, I apologize. I have another call I need to drop off, but I thank you for that response. Sure thing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Bartlett. Yeah, and, and appreciate that uh, the discussion, the latter part was really talking about the the, the coordination between the, the distribution system writ large and the and the transmission and PJM and the and the utilities. Um, I think though that Ethan described what I thought this um, this part of the uh, the presentation that we were given uh, was about, which is the fact that um, taking Rockville as an example, um, there is um, local variability in um, load or in capacity requirement and also local variability in the potential responses that would be done, for example, through DERs uh, put on the grid. And so all this, what I understood this, um, this piece of, to be about, that 4.5, uh, was, was not so much about the interaction with the uh, transmission and the PJM, um, which seemed to be what the utilities were talking about, but rather about the need for coordination of uh, local level distribution system level forecasting and uh, load requirement um, and that they that they just be done those be they, those need to be closely linked if that's being done by everybody already that's great um it's just if it's not the way things ordinarily work then it would probably enhance planning to have those those two pieces fit together better i think that's all that this piece was about it was what happens at the distribution level level and, and rockville is a good example of why it makes sense to do that all right thanks sir um before we move on uh, ethan or eric or jacob is that something the the coordination between the distribution forecasting and load requirement is that occurring On, on the BG side, we, we do that. We do that um, on a regular judge. Yeah. All right. And, and just to add one more piece, it is ever evolving. It is, I'm sorry, you said it's uh, it, evolving? Yes, it's, it okay. is always evolving. Okay. Okay. And can I get, go ahead, Jacob. I was going to say, to add to similar to BG, it's also happening in PHI. Okay. And Smeco PE, can you guys weigh in with a, you can give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down or. All right. Well, maybe we, we'll, we can circle back. Yeah, oh, Judge. Go, go, I'm sorry, sir. I, I think we'll have to get back to you. I just that, that's not. fine. That is fine. All right. Um, Jacob, while you, while your camera's on, I know, um, uh, Mr. Kathan was, I guess, looking for a little more specificity in, in, in the, uh, your explanation on five. Is that something you guys can also consider when you're, when we go back based on, I guess, Eric's explanation? Yeah, we can okay. look to take Eric's kind right. of comments and, Great. Um, excellent. All right. Late now. All right. The next thing Dr. Bartlett had raised, and we may have already discussed it, was uh, items two, seven, and eight was uh, prudency investments. Um, Dr. Bartlett, you want to talk about that some more, or you think we kind of beat that one to death already? I think we talked about it. I don't think okay. we've actually come up with any clear conclusions about how okay. we how we incorporate it into our thinking about uh, regulations, essentially. That, again, we don't want to make regulations that um, ask the impossible of utilities or that make them go broke. Um, and at the same time, you know, we want to have uh, incentive structures that do um, what Jacob was talking about and, and actually, but, you know, with all the caveats that he introduced, but um, that help us support the utilities in making the transition that they have to make um, in their business model to 
move to a modernized distribution grid. So it just needs to be background of it. I think it's something that we need as we as we get to talking about specific regulations. I think we will need to talk about this dimension of it. And is what's the best way to make it work? Is it PIMS? Is it whatever? But um, but we can't ignore it because ultimately the decisions the utilities have to make are, are driven by um, the way their business is structured. Sure. Now, are you looking for something like, you know, if the utilities do X, then they'll get Y? Or is it something more general that you'd like to see in regs saying, you know, utilities or stakeholders could propose a PIM or some type of in, an incentive structure? I, I think we need to be as specific as possible. And again, going back to that other case, but it was 9618, um, that talking about compensation models and so on. And, and, and I'm, you know, in a sense, being supportive of the fact that the utilities are um, businesses that have to run a certain way. But, um, you know, they, the, the things they're going to be asked to do are different. So I just want to make sure that we consider that. So I would actually lean towards, as we develop regulations, we have that discussion about, um, is this going to be uh, facilitated um, or require some change in the incentive structure? Um, because if we ignore it and we put something into regs and it doesn't work well, then we're going to have problems. Mm -hmm. So it's just it's just that it's a it is a dimension of probably everything that we ultimately end up proposing as as regulation. Right. Yeah. And, and I don't. I'm not. Um, I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I just I just worry if if we get too specific in regs <clears throat> and it, for some reason it doesn't work, it's. It, takes you know a long time to to get those fixed um, right well that's why we should think about it in advance sure. yeah 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 yeah. i got it i got it okay um jacob did you want to weigh in or you just have your are you just keeping us company just keeping you company but um no is that dal's point obviously you know we we provide those comments because that's what we feel I, I think recognizing though that is a a broader conversation um that you know again as we think about what is our our lane within DSP obviously if it has potential impacts to DSP and now to your point we should probably be considerate considerative of them as we think about like what our recommendations are and, and regulation and certainly don't want to you know go down any path that creates any of those challenges I don't think we necessarily have to solve that problem here within this work group I think that is a, a kind of broader conversation that has broader impacts but to Al's point you know, those are important things and I think you know we have to account for them as we think about the regulation. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and I don't I agree that we're not going to solve it in this work group, um, especially given some of the positions we've already heard. So um okay, so we'll just footnote that as you know something to talk about as we get <clears throat> closer into developing the regs. <clears throat> Anybody else on this one? All right. Jacob, do you guys have an update on the gas electric coordination? I will defer to Ethan on that okay, one. That's fair. I was out last week, and so he may have more of an update here. Sure. I, I do. And okay, um, here's uh, where we are. Um, we have, uh, as one of the gas utilities, also, uh, we have reached out to the um, other gas utilities at um, both the GOAC level and the VP level, and at this point, um, you know they, they've been alerted to the the commission order and this proceeding. And at that point, we're we're going to leave that to them, and um, we're not responsible for their for what their engagement. Uh, and move ahead with um, our plan is to move ahead and begin simply having the meetings with our. Uh, our counterparts, and this is going to require a little bit of a mapping effort because there are some interesting overlaps. Even BG&E has areas where we have electric and no gas, but another gas utility is on is on our electric territory. And so there's going to have to be some thinking through of who has who has territories and what, and um, who has to meet with whom. But ultimately, we will 
approach this at a, um, you know, some kind of a, a way where we can document where these conversations have happened and then how that planning has impacted other planning in our, um, the kind of planning um, documents that we put together for any type of distribution plan. So this is basically going to move into a procedural stage, um, very administrative, and that, that's, I think, right now the, what we can offer without further uh, commission direction about what goals they'd like us to achieve. Okay, go ahead, Jacob. J.O. Uh, thanks for that, Ethan. Um, that's, uh, I don't know that it immediately was dawned on me that uh, BGE had um, parts of its service territory that overlapped with a non-BGE gas utility. I found that out Monday myself. Okay. <laughs> Like, okay. And because I, I do think that that's a very important um, wrinkle. I mean, um, I, I'm just learning of, or just thinking about this now, so I'm, I'm sort of still kind of reacting to it. Um, but when you say that you've reached out, uh, um, you, you've reached out to BGE Gas, right? Those are the counterparts you're talking about. Oh uh, no, BGE has reached out to the other gas utilities. Okay, Th then that. Okay, I'm glad I clarified. And that's like WGL, I'm assuming. Uh, WGL and I don't remember the names of the others, but yes, probably um, Columbia and Chesapeake would be my guess. Those are the names. Okay. And you know, that's that's other than that, it's just going to be a utility by utility, uh, you know, really just one on one interfaces because of the nature of the the spread out nature and and broken up nature of this particular set of overlaps. It, and and it, we'll report back, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I do think that um, the utility utility coordination, I, I do think that there's a, a lot there and um, a lot to discuss and it could look di very different depending on how, how you set it up. But it, how does BGE plan to coordinate with, with itself, the gas planning functions of BGE with the electric planning functions? Well, that is already something we're working on because, you know, we have, um, I forget the, the case number, but there is the the gas case open and we yeah. are we are actively pursuing the, um, the geothermal pilot as well as uh, incentives for customers to, you know, electrification incentives for customers. So these are the pieces we have going and then, you know, we understand you know, we do have the problem. I've started calling it the N minus N problem. Um, if you have, you know, 10 customers on a gas pipe, I guess it's called a feeder. We'll let's just call it a gas, on a pipe. And nine of those customers say, yeah, I want to electrify. And the 10th customer does not. Um, you still, you have an N minus N problem where you still have to serve that full feeder, mm -hmm. that full pipe. And so that is a, a, an issue that we're seeing. And I did see uh, this week an innovative program come out from California that was interesting where they are heavily incentivizing customers to, to make the switch. Um, new idea where they actually take the customers and because of that, you know, that 10th customer I mentioned, they uh, incentivize pretty much give away gas or electric, new electric appliances to all those uh, customers and so they would be getting heat pumps they'd be getting induction stoves just full subsidy of those of that transition in order to if the majority and it's the trigger is if a majority of the customers on that pipe uh elect to go with with electrification uh, you know that's the kind of model that's out there and obviously we're not there yet in maryland because it's a, a legislative fix but you know this is going to be a a this kind of a transition is going to be a longer term and need to be incentivized, in my opinion, at least, that the only way we're going to get there. So. All right. Thanks, Ethan. Uh, go ahead, Joyce. In the um, I'm working with Washington Gas and BGE um, on the warm fact, the geothermal. And so one of the things that is coming, probably the timing might not overlap, but the targeted electrification study that BGE e is looking at, I think will be helpful. And then as we MEA do our IRA rebates throughout the state, um, that's something that we're kind of looking at to see to what extent we, are, we can kind of talk to utilities and kind of do some of the community outreach together or in concert. But those are a couple issues that we're 
pretty interested. I don't know if the timing is going to completely align for this docket and the other dockets, but um, to be continued. And thank you, Joyce, for bringing up the targeted electrification study. That probably should have been in my bullet points. And considering that the person who's performing it works right around the corner from me. Uh, Ethan, before I, I let you go, mm -hmm. um, it, it's probably fair to say that it's too early to to tell like how stakeholders might be involved in whatever gas electric coordination at this you know at this point. I, I think beyond the you know what I've stated, that's what we can really say for now. It's yeah, you know, we, we are in something of a run up to a lot of different things and. This isn't at the top of the list, admittedly, given that we've got I, I, energy storage and this report to comment on this to, to deal with, and a lot of uh, a lot of drive. We're developing the drive program, and among others. So, I get this it. one's, you know, the network geothermal is happening. We've got a lot of irons in the fire. Understood. Understood. Just uh, trying to make sure I check as many boxes as I can. That's all. Absolutely. Um, all right, anyone else on this? Uh, yes, sir, Damon. Yeah, I, just one point. When you talk about coordination, um, that, that's a, an issue, at least for me, that I, I, I think I need to help get some help flushing out a bit because there are a lot of local, there are a lot of small businesses right. that, that play in this space. And so I'm not really sure yet what that fully means when we talk about coordination because right. you could talk about a, a, a small propane distributor which certainly this could impact their business it could be a very small business and so there's an economic a local economic impact and we need to make sure that these businesses are engaged in a way so that they appreciate what may be happening where the opportunities are and then where the challenges may be sure. for them and so i, I guess I, for me that needs to be flushed out a bit more right yeah no and i i, I get that um and i think you would made a similar comment before and my guess is when the commission said there needs to be, you know, coordination between the gas and electric utilities, that they were just, you know, thinking, you know, Washington Gas, uh, Chesapeake, and BGE in Columbia. But again, that's just my guess. I don't know that they were thinking, you know, the the propane providers and things of that nature. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, that that'll de definitely be something, you know, that that I highlight. And I'm sure if I miss it, you'll throw it in there as well. I appreciate it. And that's yep. good that I've said it before because I but I don't remember having said it before. So no, I it's all right. No, I, I, I definitely I, I definitely remember that. So okay. um and for us, WGL is the only gas company that touches our service territory and just at the northern portion. So understood more about the local, the small, the small businesses. Gotcha. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. Anybody else? All right. Ethan, there was one thing I wanted to follow up with you on. Uh, I, were you able to, and again, I know you're busy, and um, were you able to find anything on that uh, California prudency um, review for DERs that you referenced last meeting? Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, and a big thanks to S Samantha Weaver of CCSA who helped me run down the reference. Uh, it is extensive amounts of reading right now. Okay. Uh, and um, I think that that is a great issue for us to bring up after the November 15th. No, really, I, at this no, point, no. I, I, <laughs> I, am, okay. I am very much in triage mode. No, and, I hear you. And I, I, it's gonna, I think it's going to be a, a good conversation for this group to have. And I really appreciate Jacob Auslander's willingness to, to uh, discuss this with us as well and be happy to send him the reference too. So that, um, but you know, I think all, you know, it's something we need to digest internally. It, it is not exactly what I expected, it, but it, is, it, it does offer a, a model for how prudency can be approached from a, you, did, you follow the correct um, methodology, and that makes you know, wh whatever answer come, you came out with, that was prudency, as long as you follow the correct procedure that everyone agrees to. And I think that could help us with some of our more difficult conversations. But I think that's also a next round conversation because it's going to be complex. Okay, fair enough. Is that something? Is that a, like a okay? Joyce yeah. beat me to it. Can you can you send circulate that or is it a massive document or? It is just a, a couple of, of it's just a reference, and I will okay. send it around to the group. Great, um, thank you. Appreciate no that. Problem. Excellent. 
And, you know, we, we make no claim to supporting or it, it in any way yet, merely that it's, it seems to offer us a, a path that we could at least discuss. Very good. All right. All right. Uh, sorry. And Joyce is going to. Joyce, and I hope you can share that as well with the, the group, the Illinois law you just referenced. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, any other issues on the consensus, partial consensus uh, document that the utility sent around or the comments that Al um, made? All right. So I'm going to assume that I'm not going to assume that everybody's on board with it, but I'll just um, <clears throat> we'll just leave those issues that we haven't addressed as as they were before, uh, either non-consensus or partial consensus. Um, the only thing else that I don't think we've hit today is the metrics um, that uh, uh, Jacob and Ethan were kind enough to put together uh, from the previous report. Are people prepared to talk about that or do we want to put it off till next meeting? If people aren't prepared, let me just note how I structured the response. Please. As a guide. Um, I, I first tried to know anything that was already captured in another proceeding or another report and say, you know, the commission staff that we not create overlap. We can do those by reference. Put those first. Those we can hopefully agree that those are off the table given the commission's order. Uh, then the consensus items. And then the non-consensus items and what was the the uh, tried to capture what the um, positions were and you know what points were um, you know what what point we're trying to bring forward and if people could take a look once again at what is often a very technical explanation we give and and you know address that that I would appreciate it and I'm not sure that we're ready to do that today but you know we we. We do, if you look, this does create an extensive list of consensus metrics and then ones with reasons that we, um, ones that we think should not be included at this time. And if they could address the, our, our, our technical responses, that would be a useful way to have this conversation. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ethan. Uh, DeAndre. Uh, I would. Uh, it's, it's probably self-serving, but I would I would uh, like to uh, to uh, cast the motion that we uh, consider this at the next uh, meeting. I guess that you know self-serving for me to be able to put some uh, a proposal together uh, to address uh, the metrics. No, that, that's that's fine. That's why I threw it out there. I would just note that we've got. Um, one maybe time for another meeting before we actually have to file an update so i'm just going to throw that out there um dr bartlett yeah thanks you know i'm i'm actually glad to hear that um if by by the uh, next meeting if we can see deandre's proposal i i think that that um that'll make a, a, a good discussion. I just wanted to check in terms with Ethan in terms of how it's this is constructed. So Ethan, it looks like, so what you've done, I just wanna make sure I understand this, right? You've taken the first thing or things that you have identified are ones that are already included and specified and included in some existing report. Then you've identified an addition, any additional consensus metrics that would be um that we've we've talked about and that you all would agree on and then the non-consensus items that's for each topic right so for reliability der integration and so on um there's a whole first section for example on der integration on small generator interconnection report all those are already being uh reported on then there's an additional consensus item and then there's uh, a couple of non-consensus items. Is that the way it's structured? That is, and there's only one, and I, I did miss one other particular trick. Um, one, one I do reference that we were uh, storage metrics. 
uh, when we were having this conversation, it hadn't happened yet. And now there is extensive regulations and metrics being developed in the, the Maryland Energy Storage Initiative and the interconnection work groups under the guidance of John Burkowski. So I feel like we can take a step away from those. I don't, I, that was, since there's already a, a, a lot of SMEs engaged on those and, and an extensive report on them, two extensive reports. Could you add them to this list so that we, uh, we it looks like we might have a comprehensive list here. Um, uh, I can't because those are uh, in development. There's, it, I see. It, okay. It's, okay. Uh, we have a 250 page energy storage initiative report alone with uh, regulations that are being commented on um, due the 13th of November. So yeah, those proceedings are, are happening without our having to do it. And honestly, I think that's kind of handy since we've already got a heavy load. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, um, anybody else? All right. So, why don't we plan next week or on the 24th to talk about metrics? If there are proposals out there that you want to throw out <clears throat> or throw out for consideration, I should say. Ooh, excuse me. Um, let's plan on circulating those by the 17th to everyone. Um, and I'll follow up. I've got a short list of things, um, uh, just some clarifications that um, Dr. Bartlett and uh, Mr. Kathan had referenced and requested uh, in relation to the consensus or the non-consensus and partial consensus items. And I'll throw that in an email. But other than that, um, is there anything else we need to put on our to-do list for the 24th? Okay, hearing none, uh, I'll plan on seeing everybody on the 24th. Uh, I'll note we, we need to start a little bit later. I've got a meeting uh, at 10 o'clock, at least as of right now, unless it moves. Um, so let's plan on starting at 11 on the 24th, okay? All right, thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time today. Really appreciate the constructive conversation today, too. Thanks, thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.